My name is Adam Carpenter. I'm one of the uh, program directors in the Division of Public Research at NIADS. I'm a uh, uh, pediatrician and I'm a child neurologist. And so um, kids are important to me, but I also um, at one time had parents that sort of are uh, older folks. Okay, so my son, my 11 year old, is at camp this week. And he emailed me and said, Dad, this is what I got for lunch. So it's a hot dog. Um, here's the question. Um, can you have, can a good bun disguise the taste or disguise the experience of a bad hot dog? Or not, not maybe not a great hot dog, but I'll take that. Can a good bun, so it uh, can. Can a uh, bad bun ruin the whole experience? Bad bun can totally ruin the whole experience. So the moral of the story is you can't just pay attention to what's in the middle. You've got to pay attention to what's on the outside, too. Okay, and that's going to be the theme of this talk. So two objectives listing differences relevant to clinical trials between people at the extremes of age um, and those in the middle, and then identify opportunities to be meaningfully inclusive in clinical trials. Um, I have, I guess I should have put this in here. I have no disclosures except I work for the federal government. Okay, so some challenges and opportunities. So why bother with the spectrum of age? So obviously diseases occur in people of all ages. I think that's sort of a crazy little platitude. Um, and as I think we've all learned, and we're going to elaborate on this just a little bit, pharmacokinetics differ at the extremes of age. So in responses, I would say, to certain devices, and the behavior interventions you would do at the extremes of age may be different than those that you would do in middle-aged people as well. Um, medication interactions are more common in older adults only because they're taking more. Um, children and older adults are understudied in clinical trials, and so we're just going to touch on this briefly. Um, here, but we're going to elaborate on this further in a few minutes. One example is that cancer diagnoses and deaths occur very frequently in people who are over 65 years of age. I'll show you some data showing that they're actually underrepresented in reported trials. Second point is virtually no seizure medicines have an FDA indication in the FDA's. We use them, and it's actually funny because when someone says to me, you know, the FDA is looking at you know, this drug of interest, a lot of child neurologists like me start to get nervous because then all of a sudden we've got the insurance companies are going to follow whatever those indications are and it may sort of um, decrease our options. Okay, so just by way of example, renal function changes, as you know, um, you, will, you will remember from your time at the NICU in medical school, um, that uh, GFR changes over time, and it changes pretty rapidly. A one week old, uh, so there's some standardized data published in 2003, uh, one week old has a GFR, a mean GFR of 41, and that number almost doubles after two months of age. And then that number um, goes up a little bit more, and as you can see, it actually it sort of peaks and then starts to come down just a little bit. Um, so that's just one example of a physiological change. But it, it can bless you. But this can be disease related too. And so this is um, a study that was just published recently uh, Kaplan Myers and Rival Curves looking at pediatric onset MS, comparing it to adult onset MS, looking at uh, EDSS scores in uh, EDSS-6 scores. And so as you can see, the children who had uh, pediatric onset took them longer to reach all three of the disabilities milestones for MS onset, but they did so at a younger age than adult onset. And so even disease progression, not just normal physiology, but disease progression may differ between children and adults. So what are some of the challenges of extremes of age? And we're going to talk about um, a, a workshop uh, that was done, that was actually led in part by a pediatrician, um, but she actually focused a lot on what's happening in, in older people as well. So there's a limited number of patients uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. Limited blood volume, this is a big one. If you're going to be doing a study in children, you have to remember that you can't just hook their veins up the wall section and take, you know, Perceived study risks, including things like blood draws and obtaining other types of fluid, too, including cerebrospinal fluid. There can be variability in site enrollment and um, contracting between sites, particularly when you talk about something like Neuronex, which does have some pediatric capabilities, but, uh, but it, it's, you, know, you may have an adult. So, as you may or may not know, child neurology departments, roughly half of them are housed in departments of pediatrics, and roughly, roughly it changes over time. Um, the other half are housed in the parts of neurology. So, um, and, and that may have implications, especially if it's a freestanding children's hospital versus 
a children's rule that's embedded or a children's unit that's embedded within a larger general hospital. There may be competing research priorities, uh, low consent rates, and, and I can elaborate on that more if you want to while we're talking while we're taking questions. Uh, there may be, believe it or not, lack of validated endpoints. You can't just take something that's used in, that's been validated in a specific age group and necessarily extend it either older or younger, uh, particularly when you're talking about the extremes of age. Um, there can be some limited research funding, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit about some initiatives related to that. Lack of trained pediatric clinical investigators. Please show up hands. How many people here are peds? Um, okay, and then lack of pediatric clinical pharmacology expertise. That's that's a pretty rare group too. So why bother with the spectrums of age? So I am, um, as I said, a, a pediatric epileptologist. And so this is the global prevalence of idiopathic epilepsy by age and sex. These are some data that were just released uh, about a month ago. Um, and as you can see, there's actually, you guys in this medical school, there's sort of two peaks in prevalence. There's younger childhood and then older adults. Um, so here's, here's the thing. Most of the clinical trials are done during that dip in that age group. They're not done typically in children, except for some of the newer drugs. And we certainly don't know a whole lot about many of these drugs in older adults either. So if you look at who, who actually gets studied, it's generally the people who are going to be having lower prevalences. And the etiology, I didn't, I didn't even make a slide of this, the etiology of seizures in this group is different than it is in both older adults and younger children. So you need to think about that. Think about what question you want to ask and how you're going to answer it. Someone alluded to um, publication problems. Um, what data get published? I think someone alluded to this yesterday. So I'm going to give you some numbers. Um, clinicaltrials.gov, so it's a series of studies that reported this. Clinicaltrials.gov, only 6% of 19,000 trials in children from birth to 17 years, but the age group is 25% of the population. So that's underserved, right? 25% so of the population only results in 6% of clinical trials. 85% of 67,000 roughly PICU patients, or 39 hospitals, receive medication off label because the studies haven't been done for those indications. Another um, study, 559 randomized clinical trials, 19% were discontinued early, and that represented 8,400 children. Difficulty with patient accrual is the most common reason. So, the, so what I said on that first slide was not just theoretical problems, those were actual, real, documented problems. Less likely to be discontinued if funded by industry compared to academic institutions. So industry, you know, so Deidre can probably uh, attest to this too, industry tends to be pretty selective about where they're going to ask a trial to be done, because uh, I think they have generally a general pretty good record of knowing who can produce and who can in terms of uh, enrollment. Um, 455 completed trials, 30% of them were not published, representing data from almost 70,000 children. 70,000 children's data were not used, not published. Positive, negative, who cares? But at least it's information, right? Um, industry funded trials were more than twice as likely to not be published and had longer mean time to publication. So, although they weren't just continued, they were, if they were funded by industry, they were less likely to be published for probably a whole variety of reasons. Nonetheless, these are pediatric trials. This is where things, where things stand. This is just, you're not supposed to actually be able to read this table, um, but what it shows you, these are anti-seizure medicines, registered phase three, so these are registered phase three clinical trials in epilepsy, and the number of unpublished trials um, is actually pretty, it's pretty impressive. These are data published in 2016. What about ethics considerations? So the, the perspective that I was taught when I was in medical school is why would you include a vulnerable population in research? Concerns about limited ability to consent. Can a young child really consent? At what age can you start to make assent? What about the adolescents who are normally normal developmentally? There are safety concerns. So the theme was protection from research. The more modern perspective is that it's not ethical to exclude them. And so it's protection through research. It's just that the study has to be well designed, well planned, and then well executed. So safety and consent are obviously major concerns. There's an awful lot of discussion about it. Uh, but this, if you think about it, parallels to a certain extent the debate that's been on the pages of neurology, the Green Journal, talking about what do you do with consent in older adults who may or may not be entering the years where uh, their cognition may not be what it was when they were younger. 
Okay, so those are the problems, the challenges. But we're going to talk about some solutions that are in place. I'm not sure that they're solving all the problems, but it's what it is, right? So um, NIH has an inclusion across the lifespan policy to ensure that individuals, including clinical research, are appropriate to the scientific question that they're studying. So that the money that we're spending, remember, these are your tax dollars, right? You're, this is your money. Um, is applicable to everybody who's affected by the, the, the diseases and conditions. It applies for everything that came in since January uh, of this year. There's also uh, public uh, PHS human subjects and clinical trial information forms. This is something you fill out when you're doing your application. <clears throat> and then scientific review groups are um, actually tasked with assessing proposals as being either acceptable or unacceptable. When you get a summary statement back, there's going to be a statement about this, about inclusion across the age span. So um, FDA uh, has gotten into the game too. Um, you should know in 2002, uh, the Best Pharmaceuticals for Children Act uh, came into effect. Um, it grants an additional six months of market exclusivity in return for voluntarily performing FDA requested studies in children. And then in 2003, that was followed up by PREA, which is the Pediatric Research Equity Act, which um, authorizes FDA to require study of new entities in children. So this is more for new, uh, new drugs uh, coming up. Sponsors have to submit safety data and efficacy, or they can justify extrapolation. We're going to talk about what extrapolation is in a little more detail in a minute. And um, so waivers and deferrals, however, were granted in greater than 85% of applications. And so for a variety of reasons, the people coming in with the application said, so well, we really can't do it in children or adults. I mean, some of them are legitimate. Some diseases do not have children. That's fine. Doing an Alzheimer's study is not going to include children. Uh, it may include doing adults and adults, but it's not going to include the other children. Uh, orphan drugs were excluded because uh, those diseases, as Eric discussed the other day, disproportionately. Uh, so in terms of the results, so that's what was, what was uh, proposed, and here are the results. So 772 products are now labeled with pediatric-specific information. There are 186 labels due to the BPCA, 420 labels due to PREA, uh, 49 of them are results of the so-called pediatric rule, which is pre-PREA, I don't know that you that detail, 117 due to both. So this is as of January 30th of this year. So there's more work to do, but clearly there has been a, a shift uh, in how things are being uh, executed. So, uh, so I think we're going to talk about extrapolation. <clears throat> so the idea behind extrapolation is that uh, the proposal is that if a drug is found to be effective in adults and some studies in children, FDA may say may require the sponsor only to do safety studies and some pharmacokinetic studies. Um, and this is something that was, that's been proposed, you know, again, for the last seven years. <clears throat> this was a systematic review. Uh, the first off was Jack Pollock, I don't know if you guys know him, but um, this is something that he had really been pushing for a while. And so the question is, what, what do the data look like? How do the data look like? So I'm going to show you all you really actually need to focus on. I'm going to have a pointer right here. All you need to focus on is just the right side of, of the graph. Some of these studies are pediatric, some of them are adult. The first row is for um, gabapentin, second row is for lotrigine, the last, or last cluster is for levetiracetam. And as you can see, there really aren't uh, uh, huge differences between the pediatric studies and the adult studies, although there aren't as many pediatric studies. So based on this, uh, Jack was making the case in 2017, so that went down to four years of age. Um, actually, let me do this one first. Okay, so in 2018, FDA uh, provided some draft guidance saying that there are instances for seizure medicines, the anti seizure medicines used for focal onset seizures where they will, they are willing to extrapolate, provided that the sponsor provides appropriate pharmacokinetic data and appropriate um, safety data. Um, Jack tried to push that down in 2017, tried to push it down in two years. FDA was um, not as happy about that. So what about some more recent legislation guidance? So the 21st Century Cures Act, um, most of you are probably familiar with it, for clinical trials, it now requires that NIH collect data on inclusion by age. So if you file an application at NIH, uh, the data on age will be collected. 
And then uh, there's additional FDA guidance at pediatric trials, which just came out. This is more for your uh, more for your information than anything else. The FDA is constantly updating its, its guidance on what to do about uh, uh, children and adolescents. Uh, they recently put something out about including adolescent patients in adult psychology trials. Uh, and then there's a whole bunch of guidance that FDA has come up with. So before you propose something, you may want to look to see what FDA is saying these days. So there was this workshop that I mentioned uh, in June of 2017 called Inclusion Across the Lifespan. Um, and this was really more about those tails of the curves that I mentioned earlier. So uh, there was a series of recommendations. I'm going to go through these. I'm not going to go through every single one of them, but I just want to give you a flavor of what sorts of things were discussed as recommendations going forward. And so um, the, the recommendations were to involve stakeholders. And I think this is a theme that keeps coming up, of course, at least a number of times. And I can tell you that in some of our funding announcements now, we actually strongly recommend it. If someone from the government says strongly recommend it, it means you probably should do it. Um, because that's something that, that reviewers will be asked to comment on. Um, uh, identification, recruitment, and retention of populations needed for, for the study and adapting them to accommodate participants with impaired function. <clears throat> Defining unique abilities in adolescents. Uh, anyone who has uh, been an adolescent or uh, has an adolescent at home knows that they're a different species. They're, they're interesting, but um, uh, you never know what's going to come up next. Um, trying to make studies easier for participants, easier for families to participate in, and again, this is more relevant at the ends, at both ends of the age spectrum. It's not just for children, for people who are providing care for their age of uh, parents, that also family members, that can be a huge issue as well. Um, and then developing a more robust assent process. I think that we're going to be seeing that kind of more. Um, for study design, they made comments about um, how to balance inclusion for representative samples, encouraging participation, uh, and making sure that uh, inclusion uh, yields scientific value. You can't just say we're going to throw five kids into the study or five older adults into the study. Uh, there has to be some meaningful, we do this actually just came up with a study that uh, overseeing what they said. Uh, uh, so we're, they literally said we're going to throw in five patients of the same age group just to say that we included that. And that, uh, you might imagine that did not make a lot of enthusiasm for me. Um, and then there may be alternative study designs that you might want to consider as well. Uh, as far as the review process, <clears throat> there's going to be more, you, you will probably be seeing more over time about inclusion. I've already talked about the inclusion across the ages criteria. There may be, I don't know, I have no knowledge of this, but there, I wouldn't be surprised if there's more coming down the pipe those terms. And then for data collection, can consider standardizing demographic data collection. I would just remind you, this is something that hasn't come up a lot in the conference this time for some reason. Um, NIH has common data elements that is a set of elements that you can use actually to populate your case report forms so that collection of certain types of data are standardized across studies. A good example would be age bands or uh, So um, think about it, that we don't have common data elements for every single disease and indication. They actually take years to develop, and it's a consensus process for experts in the community. And, uh, it's a whole big deal. However, there's, there, there actually are some core common data elements that would apply to any kind of study that you have, regardless of whether it's a drug, a device, or a behavioral intervention. Uh, but you really should think about using those. And there are actually pediatric specific so they're there to be used. So we had a webinar that did for this group that Carolina and I and Alfa Sherman did. So you guys did it. I hear people talking about it here. So uh -huh. I wanted to like throw it in there. So uh -huh. go back and review. No, so really like go back and review Carolina and, and Robin's uh, webinar. Um, uh, looking at things like reporting by age, we talked about how NIH has to actually NIH has to report that to Congress now. Um, that's what the 21st century. Years happening is about and standardizing age grouping so that you can have more meaningful interpretation of results um, and then age related outcomes. And then another thing is data availability is something you're going to see more and more of the time. 
uh, training and education implementing changes to the language used to define vulnerable and underrepresented uh, groups. Uh, this is something I think we're, we're a lot more sensitive to these sorts of things now, and so it's important to include that as a society, and so it's important to include that in your thought process and uh, the written language and verbal language that's used as you're recruiting and retaining uh, participants in your studies. Uh, increasing awareness and understanding of policies on inclusion and exclusion, and including appropriate expertise for the populations who are actually studying. So, all right, that was a little bit of a whirlwind tour, but our objective is just to remind you of those differences relative to clinical trials between uh, people at the extremes of age and those in the middle, and identify some opportunities. Um, so that's all I got, but I'm happy to take, I want to leave a few minutes for questions. Um, so what, is, what how is how is this question addressed in review? Like what, what is when, when the peer reviewers are reviewing grants, what are they supposed to, what are the instructions do they get about how to address whether including or excluding children is justified versus not? So, so Will's asking, what, um, how's this addressed in, in review in, in um, NIH study sections? Because I can't speak for private foundations or, or FDA. Um, the uh, SRO is supposed to be, or the chair, are supposed to be including that as a part of the discussion when an application is being discussed. Um, it's not always consistent, but I think we're hearing more and more of the comment of, hey, what about inclusion? Because it's not the only other review criteria that comes up. We're talking about sex and biological variable. We're talking about uh, rigor and reproducibility. So when it goes into that, it's, a, it's one of those things that they are supposed to tick off. Um, I've actually recently heard a couple in the last round, just this most recent round. Um, I actually had a, a couple of study sessions where they said, you know, they really they could have included people across the age spectrum, and they didn't. So I think we may be seeing two of them. Uh, two different SROs, so it, it, uh, you may be seeing that more and more, I wouldn't be surprised. Robin, do you have a perspective on that? Uh, no, not necessarily, but I know there's another question. Okay. Yes? So I, I'm interested to hear more about your um, comments on the extrapolation of the data from adults and kids. Do you think that's a good solution to the problems, or it should be more of a systematic way out to the problem? Yeah, so the question is, do I think extrapolation is a good idea? I think that the reality is that recruitment for the, I mean, the question is, what's the disease? So focal onset seizures in children four and above is pretty similar, it's similar enough to the epilepsy in adults, but certainly middle-aged adults and older adults, that I think it's a good idea only because it, if, and so remember, they still have to do safety and pharmacodynamics. So that, you don't get off the hook for that. But in terms of efficacy, FDA's concern is, is the disease close enough? So when you talk about generalized epilepsies, FDA is thinking about them. That's about the best you can get out of FDA. But for certain diseases, and it's not just epilepsy, they're doing it for other diseases too. I think it's a great idea because you're, you're going to be, when you consider the potential benefit to risk ratio of that treatment, first of all, we're going to be doing it Second of all, we don't want to be in a position where we are denying, the way I look at it is I don't want to be denying my patients an opportunity to, be, to take a medicine that would be useful for them to take. Even though I can write it off label, the insurance company doesn't have to agree with me. So, and I've had pushback on, uh, let's see, what have I had pushback on? I'd say probably half the seizure medicine at one point or another, so I still see patients. And I've had pushback from the insurance company saying, can't do that. It's like, okay, I've been doing it for years. They don't care about that. So, Can you speak to like the on the on your application, your justification for your choice of the trust? Does that help? I mean, I assume it does. It does. I mean, and, and I think you know that this goes both ways. It may be, like I said, Alzheimer's happened or Parkinson's disease happened. Pretty obvious, and most people write like one or two sentences. 
for Parkinson's disease respect does not occur in children. That's it. I mean, it's really, this is not supposed to be a, you know, real, it's not supposed to throw you for a loop. But it does make you think about, some, for some of our diseases, you really do need to think about whether you, whether you should be having this. <coughs> and the guidance we're getting is a really good, pretty darn good excuse for not doing it. Is there another question? I was just saying, in my space section, uh, it's highly dependent on your reviewer, but it's definitely something that's paying more and more, uh, <coughs> more and more promise to achieve. And we say just a few years ago, the sex is a biology variable. So long as you stratify by sex, that was sufficient answer. But more and more, I'm seeing, no, 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 no. Women are very different, and there's a premenopause and postmenopause journey. What's their had had children? They haven't had children. There's so many variables to consider. Why aren't you considering sex in the biology variable? And I think the same thing happened with age. Uh, you may start with the yes, we'll actual include age as a variable. And those kinds of things okay. Well, we'll, we'll say you responded. Eventually, you will become no. So children are so different from grown-ups, and uh, and elderly, and uh, the, the, the aspects of the age. Yeah, so I mean, we're kind of sending two messages here. One, right? One is children are different than adults, and that's why you need to include them. The other is extrapolation. Children aren't that different than adults. But I think the point is you've got to pay attention to what you're doing, be very thoughtful and deliberate about what you're doing, and justify what you're doing. I think that's really, uh, to me, and <coughs> practice and clinician, to me, that's the most important thing I agree to study is why they're there, why they're going to do it. So um, I mean, we want to be deliberate about it. They're not just little blocks. They have a lot of interesting biology, and I've dedicated my career to that. Well, do you have another question? Yeah, like, I guess, like, what, how much of it do you think is structural because of how institutions are oriented? I mean, I would say that it would make more sense to do a traumatic brain injury study in people <coughs> 15 to 25 than 18 to 60. But since that often crosses institutions, like a pediatric hospital versus an adult hospital, that represents a sort of substantial kind of administrative barrier to doing that type of research. But I think it would be pretty relevant because you know, TBI and adolescence would be an important thing to study. Yeah, so I'm going I'm to paraphrase Dan here. Uh, <clears throat> something he said earlier, if you want to do, you want to propose the best, the most meaningful biological study you can do, if that means you have to cross an administrative boundary. I mean, we have, like, Miramax, just as an example, is something that should theoretically be able to handle that study. And take a little bit of a bite out of you having to do all that legwork to all your friends in the medical school. You do that with these. Right? So, so then you do want to take advantage, use a network like structure to take advantage of the scale of the administrative work. That's, that's you know, one of the other reasons why those are designed. And there are, there, there are a lot of informal networks too. You know, that's what the is all about. Miramax is awesome as Miramax is, but I can't do every single study in the world, and so a lot of people come up with more informal networks. And hospital systems, I mean, now that you have this whole ACO thing, hospital systems are doing it on their own for totally different reasons. But there are ways to cross administrative boundaries that way, too, to think about that. So, you know, some systems, so I can think of some systems that have multi state hospitals. That's one way to get around some of this. So, it's a good view. Yeah, 100% right, so it's a very important question. Well, thank you for paying attention to Dog Dog Dog.